بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين رب شرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد الحج أشر معلومات فمن فرض فيهن الحج فلا رفت ولا فسوق ولا جدال في الحج وما تفعلوا من خير يعلمه الله وتزودوا فإن خير الزاد التقوى والتقون يا أولي الألباب These are the days of Hajj and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says for the pilgrims who are traveling to Mecca the holy city that they need to take their provisions with them and the best provision that they can take is taqwa is piety and it's uh, amazing that the Hajj season comes after Ramadan the month of taqwa where we had an opportunity to increase our piety, our righteousness, and our fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the provision for the hujjaj uh, of taqwa is appropriate that uh, it happens after Ramadan, so close to Ramadan. But of course, there are many things that people need to take with them uh, on hajj. And normally when I uh, give advice to brothers or sisters who are going for hajj, I normally give them about four or five uh, advices. I keep it very short and very simple. In addition to the taqwa that they need to take, they also need to pack a separate suitcase of sabr, of patience. They need to pack a separate suitcase of patience, of sabr, because they're going to need it there. It doesn't matter how much money they take with them, but if they forget that bag at home, khalas, their, their, their trip is going to be miserable. The second advice I normally give is um, expect the worst and you will be pleasantly surprised. So if you go for Hajj not expecting anything, I'm talking about uh, facilities and so forth. Of course, we expect to get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's the third advice is to stay focused on why you're going for Hajj. But I'll just go back to the second advice, which is expect the worst and you will be pleasantly surprised. So you get to Mecca, you expect to sleep on the floor. You come to your room, you find a bed. What do you say? Alhamdulillah. Right? You expect to walk from Mecca to Mina. You get out of your hotel, you find what? A bus waiting for you. You say, Alhamdulillah. You get into the bus, you don't expect the bus to be air conditioned. But what happens to the bus? The bus is air conditioned. What do you say? Alhamdulillah. So your whole trip, are you going to be disappointed? You didn't expect anything, right? So nothing can disappoint you because you didn't expect anything. But those people, unfortunately, who go expecting a lot, guess what happens to them? They get disappointed. And they start whinging. You know from where they start whinging? From Sydney Airport already. <laughs> they haven't even left yet. They were already whinging. And I feel the brothers who take care of the Hajj trips and the Hajj packages like Sheikh Shadi and the brothers with him, I feel them really sorry. Because this, this is the toughest job in the world, is to manage a group of pilgrims. It's the toughest job in the world. I wouldn't want it. I wouldn't take on this responsibility because you need so much patience. Sheikh Shadi needs to take three bags, four bags of patience with him to deal with all the issues. So that was the second advice, right? The third advice is to stay focused on why you're going. Why do people go for Hajj? Why do people go for pilgrimage? It is to fulfill an obligation as part of our contract with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's one of the five pillars in our contract with Allah azza wa jal. So if you, if you are taking the you are paying the money, you're making the effort, you're making all the plans to go, you may as well make sure that you fulfill that part as best as you can. But you'll be amazed when people come there, they lose their focus as to why they're there. A lot of people get caught up in what? Shopping. And they get caught up in the shopping already before they leave, making lists of things that they need to get making sure they don't leave this one out, don't leave that one out. 
and they get so caught up in spending all their time in the souks when they should be spending their time in the masjid, the haram, where the rewards are 100,000 and so forth. And the masjid of the Prophet Sallallahu I'm not saying don't, don't buy gifts, okay? Because the Prophet Sallallahu said, tahadu, tahabu. The giving of gifts increases the love. So that, that can occur on the trip. Buying of the gifts can occur on the trip. And what I normally suggest is if you're going to Medina first, where should you do your shopping? Do your shopping in Medina. Do your shopping in Medina. Get it over and done with. So that when you leave Medina to go to Mecca, now you're 100% focused on what? On the five days or six days of Hajj. That's it. Nothing is going to distract you now. Another distraction is people go as tourists. So they've got the camera packed and the video camera packed and they want to take photos here and get their photos taken there. And again, they're losing sight of why they went. It can just become a, a source of attraction, uh, distraction. So we need to stay focused on why we're going. The fourth advice that I normally tell people is please, please, whatever you do, learn the Hajj. Learn the fiqh of the Hajj. It's like making salah. You can't tell a brother, brother, come make salah, and you just bring him to the masjid, and you, that's it, khalas, you just leave him. There you go, make salah now. He just came in for the first time. Now he needs to make salah. How is he going to pray? He doesn't know how to pray. He doesn't even have wudu. So the same thing with hajj. You need to know the hajj to be able to do the hajj. That's why in, in South Africa, where I grew up, they used to run classes for months teaching the fiqh of hajj before you went for hajj. So when people went for hajj, they knew and they understood what it is they were doing. Now people expect Sheikh Shadi. No worries, the Sheikh is with us. The Sheikh will take care of everything for us. So people go there, they, get, they, get, they come to Mecca, they go into the Haram, they see the Kaaba for the first time, they don't know what to do. Now they're shocked, they're stunned. What, what do I do now? I'm here now. What do I do? Where does the Tawaf start? I have no clue. I see people going around and around and around. Where do I start? Where's the start? Is there a starting point or do I just join in? How many times do I go around? I heard people say seven. Is there some, some of the seven that I need to go faster, that I need to run, that I need to walk? What about, do I start my side at Marwa or Safa? Where's Safa? I know of one person who went on Hajj and thought that to do the Sa'i between Safa and Marwa meant that you go from Safa to Marwa and back. That counted as one. You, how, you know how many times you went back and forth? 14 times instead of seven. Because from Safa to Marwa is counted as one. Not Safa, Marwa, Safa as one. So he, end, he started on the right place, but he ended in Marwa. You, uh, he ended back in Safa. You're supposed to end up in Marwa. And this is someone who's supposed to know. And he was, <laughs> subhanAllah. But it's amazing. People go there and they don't know what they're doing. And they expect to be taught. Sheikh Shadi will have his lessons probably after Salat Isha every night, right? He will have his lessons in the hotel, probably on the roof of the hotel. Like Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Yahya did when we were there, or Sheikh Taj. <clears throat> and then he will try to teach the people there. It's too late to learn there. Now you're going to cram everything into those few nights to learn about the Hajj. You need to study the Hajj before you go. It's not difficult to learn. I'm not saying it's, it's, it's difficult. It's easy to learn the fiqh of the Hajj, but people need to learn it. And also important to that is not only learning the fiqh of Hajj, it's also to learn the history of the Hajj. To learn actually what happened. Why, why am I doing this? Why are we doing tawaf around the Kaaba? When did it all start? And that's my topic tonight. My topic is about Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Because the Hajj started with Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. He is the one who called the people. When nobody could hear, right? Uh, but Allah told him, invite. He said, but I can't see people. Allah said, don't worry. Just do the invitation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send the people. So the people started coming for pilgrimage at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. But was the Kaaba built then? Was the Kaaba built by Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam in Ismail? 
And that's what most of the people say, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the dua that Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam made when Allah ordered him to go from Egypt to Mecca when he just gave birth, when his wife Hajar just gave birth to Ismail. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered that he, took, that he takes them to Mecca and leaves them there. And as he's leaving, he makes a dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says, Rabbana inni askantu min dhurriyyati biwadin ghayri li zar'in inda baytika al-muharram. So this, the translation of this, he says, Oh, our Lord, I have made some of my offspring, meaning his wife and his son, to live in a valley without cultivation. Nothing grows in Mecca. Mecca is, is a valley with mountains around it and nothing grows there. Nothing can grow there. Everything that people consume in Mecca has to be brought from outside. So, but he says, he adds, عند بيتك المحرم by your sacred house. So the scholars of tafsir say that. Okay, what does this mean? If Ibrahim founded the foundation, established the foundation first, he did not build the Kaaba then. He was leaving his wife Hajar and Ismail. When did he build the Kaaba? Only later when he returned and he found Ismail, now a young man, strong enough to help him. That's when they built the Kaaba. So some of the scholars of Tafsir say that the Kaaba was already there, but it had been destroyed. The foundation was still there. So when he came and rebuilt the Kaaba, he built it on the foundation where the Kaaba was originally built by Adam and his wife Hawa. And that's from a hadith in Bayhaqi, which is a weak hadith. So some of the scholars uh, will, di will have a difference of opinion on that, whether it was built by Adam or by Ibrahim for the first time. But anyway, it's the house of Allah. It is Baytullah. It is the sacred house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to learn the history also. We need to learn the history of what happens. Why, why the Kaaba? Why do we go to the Kaaba? And we, know, we, we must know that history of Ibrahim and Ismail building it. And when, it was, when, when, it was, uh, when the walls were so high that they could not go any further, they used a, a block of stone as a scaffolding to stand and make the walls as high as they are today. And that scaffolding still exists, that block of stone still exists today. And it is called Maqam Ibrahim. And you will find it next to the Haram. And when the Hujjaj finished their seven tawaf around the Kaaba, they were trying to kiss the black stone. If they can't, they will just uh, indicate to it. Then they will go and perform two raka'at behind Maqam Ibrahim. And why do, they, why do they uncover their shoulders? Why for the men do they uncover their right shoulders when they are doing tawaf? And why are some of the circuits fast and some are walking? Meaning some of them you walk, some of them you run. Why? Those are all the things we need to know. The same thing with Safa to Marwa. Hajar and Ismail, when Ibrahim left them there, he left them with a little bit of food and water. But when she ran out of water, she had no water to give her new son, newborn son. She had nothing left to give him to eat or drink. She was panicking and desperate. So she went up this hill called Safa to see if she could see anybody. And there was another hill at a distance called Marwa. So she'd run off this hill, Safa, and go run up that hill, Marwa. And that's why when you're doing the Sa'i between the two green lights, you run between those lights because she actually ran. So that's why we run. Because our mother, Hajar, ran. And we do that to commemorate that. To show our reliance on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if we put our trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will provide for us. In this barren valley where nothing grows, where no one was living, Allah asked Ibrahim to leave his wife and son there. Did he disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? No, he didn't disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Hajar, his wife, did she moan and whinge and chuck a dummy spit like our wives sometimes do today? Or husbands also, vice versa. Complain. 
All she did was she asked Ibrahim, is this a command from Allah? And when he said yes, she said, khalas, that's it. Allah has commanded you to do this, I am satisfied. So that's important. That aspect of Hajar alayhi salatu wasalam questioning Ibrahim about his decision. There are three phases to this. What she did is important for us today as well. She asked, she trusted, and she accepted. And that's the act of acceptance of Allah's will, even for us today. In order for us to accept Allah's will, we must go through that three-stage process. The first is to question with your mind, with your intellect, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us a mind to think. And that's why Allah tells us in the Quran, use your mind to think. So it is natural to ask the question. But we don't ask like some people today, they ask because they really don't want to know. They either want to cause fitna, that's why they ask, or they want to trap the, the imam or the sheikh, or they want to show how smart they are. They are smarter than the, the, the sheikh or the imam or the teacher. That's not the reason for asking. That's not the purpose behind asking. When you ask, you want to know the truth. You want to understand. So that's why she asked Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. So you ask with your mind. Then the second, you, you, you understand. Once you get the answer, you understand the importance and the significance of it with your intellect. And then the third is in the heart. And then you submit. Once you've, once you've inquired and understood, you accept in your heart. And that is when acceptance and submission comes. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to do something and we go through that three-step process, we submit. Now these are the days of the hajjah The ten days of the hajjah The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as you know, said in the hadith, there are no days that are dearer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in respect of the ibadah that we do than the first days of the hajjah And in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالْفَجْرْ وَلَيَالِ نَعْشْرْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala swears an oath by the dawn, by the fajr, and the ten days, the ten nights. And the scholars are divided onto which ten nights they are. Some of the scholars will say these are the ten nights of the hijjah the first ten, ten days of the hijjah and others will say they are the last ten days of Ramadan. But anyway, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ is very clear. These are the most loved days to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we should increase our ibadah in, in them. Unfortunately, it's really sad to see how little significance people give to these ten days. And especially the Arafah and the Eid. You will find because the Eid this year is on a Friday, you will find the numbers attending the Eid Salah drop dramatically compared to the Eid of Fitr, which we had on a Sunday, right? Was it on a Sunday or a Saturday? It was a Sunday, right? Look at the numbers this year. Look at the numbers on Friday. For those of you, I'm not going to go into the moon dispute, okay? <laughs> For those of you who are, who are doing international, uh, who follow international sighting of the moon, you will be having Eid on Friday. For those of you who follow local sighting, Australian sighting only, you will be having your Eid on Saturday. Doesn't matter, okay? But have a look at the numbers, especially the numbers on Friday. Because what are people going to give priority on Friday? Are they going to give priority to this Eid, this celebration, or to priority, uh, priority to their work or to their other commitments? And it's really sad to see how people choose. Islam only has three celebrations. Only three celebrations. The Eid of Fitr, the Eid of uh, uh, Eid al-Adha, and which other Eid? The Jum'ah. The Jum'ah is an Eid. Every Friday we celebrate. What do we celebrate on Fridays? We celebrate the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, no matter what you're doing, no matter where you are, when Allah calls you, you come. You leave off your trade because the remembrance of Allah, dhikrullah, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that time is more important than anything else. 
You could be a surgeon, you could be a um, uh, pilot, you could be an astronaut, it doesn't matter, a physicist, um, a carpenter, a builder. But at that time, Allah's remembrance takes preference over everything else on this dunya. That's why it's an Eid, because we are celebrating what? We are celebrating our ta'a, our obedience, our submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Jum'ah is a celebration. That's why the Prophet sallallahu said, anybody who misses, any man who misses three Fridays in a row without a valid excuse. So Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, I, I'm jumping a bit here and there, right? But it's still about Ibrahim. And I, I won't keep you too long, inshallah, because I know the sisters have more important things to be talking about, as Brother Rami mentioned. <laughs> I'm only kidding, Rami. <laughs> Khair, inshallah. Where did Ibrahim start? Let, let's go back to Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. When did he live? When was his era? His era was more than 4,000 years ago. And we call him our forefather. <coughs> we also call him the pioneer of Harakah Islamiyah. Ibrahim is the pioneer of, the har of Harakah Islamiyah, the Islamic movement. The Islamic movement that we know today, Ibrahim is our pioneer. Because he is the one, he is the first messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first messenger who actually moved to invite people to Islam and spread Islam. All the other prophets and messengers before him just stayed in their localities. They were prophets and messengers and they gave their message to their people, but they stayed local. Ibrahim was the first one. He moved from Babylon, then he went to Egypt. He lived in Egypt for a while. Then from Egypt, he came and took Hajar and Ismail to Mecca and he visited them a few times. Then he went to Palestine and so forth. So we call him the pioneer of Harakah Islamiyah, the Islamic movement. So the Islamic movement that we are living today we are following in the footsteps of our forefather Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. Ibrahim grew up in a, in a home where his dad was an idol maker. He used to make the statues and the idols that people used to worship at their time. So they were worshipping idols. That was their religion, they were idol worshippers. And Ibrahim, as he was a young man, he used to look at his dad uh, carving these, these idols and shaping them and he used to wonder why is my dad's making toys right he was a kid my dad's making toys that's what he thought he first thought my dad's making toys for kids to play with but then he saw as he grew a little bit older he saw grown men and women bowing prostrating to these toys he said what, what's going on these people are supposed to be playing with toys not bowing to them and, and really got him thinking and then one day he started questioning and people were making offerings and bringing food and everything and asking things of these idols. Basically, they were worshipping them. And they had their temple with all these idols there and people used to go and visit it. So Ibrahim started questioning himself and, and this didn't make sense to him. Why, why are people worship, worshipping these stones, wor worshipping these pieces of wood that were made, made by the hands of a man? It, it didn't make sense to him. So he looked at the stars, he looked at the moon, he looked at the sun asking, is, is this the creator of everything? And because the stars, the stars set, the moon sets, the sun sets, the answer was no, it cannot be because the creator is always there. The creator has to always be there. So these things cannot be the creator, they are the created. And finally he came to the realization that it has to be, there has to be a creator of all of these things. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to him and informed him, yes, that, that, is, that is the truth. And then he went to his dad and he said, my father. The verses in the Qur'an about how Ibrahim speaks to his father is very important in terms of manners and akhlaq, of how we need to speak to our parents. Remember, his dad was a mushrik, but he still spoke to his father with the highest respect and the most beautiful of language, speaking to his own dad. And this is important for our young brothers today. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mashallah, guides you returns you to the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you need, to, you need to also acquire the manners that go with that. You, know, you need to have the manners that go with that. It's not enough just to have a beard and wear the thobe and so forth. You need, it's more important that you have the manners. 
But God, he went and he asked his dad, oh, my father, why are you worshiping these things? They, they can't do anything for you. So he was trying to talk some sense into his dad, saying that these things are, you made them. How can you worship something you made? His dad got angry with him and threatened him, and Ibrahim said, oh, okay, I, I tried, and nothing I can do with my dad. He went to the community, started talking to people about worshiping idols. People would not listen to him. They were insistent. There was no way he was going to convince them. So he, one day he was sitting and thinking, there needs to be something that I can do to get through to these people. I need to try something different. And that's also the skills of da'wah. So there are many lessons we learned from Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam in, in the, the skills of doing da'wah. We need to vary our methodology. If you try one method and you don't get through, try different ways of getting through to people. Don't, don't just use the same formula, the same method over and over and over and you're not, you're not getting anywhere. Try different methods. So Ibrahim, he realized that a, um, a celebration, an event was coming up where the people would leave their town to go to a river and have their festival along the river. So he used this opportunity when they were all away. So everybody left the city. He went into the temple. He took an axe and he smashed all the idols except one. Except the biggest idol. And he left the axe around the, the neck of the, the biggest idol. So when the people came back from their festival, they went to their temple, they saw all their idols broken. They were furious and angry. And they knew there can only be one person responsible for this. It has to be Ibrahim, because he was the one already questioning them about their worship of idols. So they called him, they arrested him and brought him. And they asked him, you did this, didn't you? He said, why don't you ask the, the one with the axe? Ask him, he's got the axe. So they said, but you know they can't do anything. So he answered them, then why do you worship these things? They can't even protect themselves, but yet you worship them. So some people were shocked and stunned when this got through to them. Finally, finally some sense went into their heads. So for that split second, few moments, the truth entered their hearts. But then the realization of it all, changes that they needed to make, they retracted from that. And they <clears throat> decided to punish Ibrahim for what he did. And the, the punishment was to throw him and burn him alive. To throw him into a fire, burn him alive. So they dug a big hole in the ground, filled it with wood, and they, they lit this massive fire. The fire was so intense and so large, and it was so high that the birds could not fly over it. That's how massive this fire was. They could not get close to the fire to put Ibrahim into the fire. So they had to come up with, with an idea of how to get Ibrahim into the fire. So what they did was they built a catapult, put Ibrahim on the catapult, and threw him into the fire. Because they couldn't get close to the fire, the, it was so intense. So they did that. They put him on the catapult, they chained, chained his arms, chained his, chained his hands, put him on the catapult. While he was on the catapult, Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam came to him and asked Ibrahim, Ibrahim, is there anything you need me to do? At this moment, right, he's about to be thrown into the fire. Jibreel asks him, is there anything you need me to do? What did Ibrahim say? He said, no, except the only thing that I wish for is that Allah is happy with me. That's the only thing that I care about is that Allah is happy with me. I'm, I'm willing to die for this now. But the only thing that really matters to me is that Allah is pleased with me. So they threw him into the... Jibreel left, offered him help. Ibrahim didn't. They threw him into the fire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered the fire to be safe and cool for him. And the fire was cool for Ibrahim. He came walking out of the flames with all his clothes still intact. Not a sign of smoke or fire was on him. The only thing that burnt were the chains that were tying him. That was the only thing that was destroyed. And when the people saw that, they said, the Lord of Ibrahim protected him. And a lot of people that day submitted to Islam. And they became Muslim. So that's the story of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam.
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam about Ibrahim because Ibrahim alayhi salatu was uh, is important for our connection with, uh, with him through the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because of the tawheed. He came and we established the tawheed. The worship of only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not associating any partners with him. But he also came to teach that we are connected with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that everybody, everything needs to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We are from Allah and to him we will return. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the Qur'an about Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa sallam when Allah says, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِهِ هُوَ اجْتَبَاكُمْ وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجٍ مِلَّةَ أَبِيكُمْ إِبْرَاهِيمِ هُوَ سَمَّاكُمُ الْمُسْلِمِينَ مِنْ قَبْلُ وَفِي هَذَا لِيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ شَهِيدًا عَلَيْكُمْ وَتَكُونُ شُهَدَاء عَلَى النَّاسِ فَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُوا الزَّكَاةَ وَاعْتَصِمُوا بِاللَّهِ هُوَ مَوْلَاكُمْ فَنِعْمَ الْمَوْلَى وَنِعْمَ النَّصِيرُ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam strive hard in his cause وَجَاهِدُوا فِي وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ and strive in his cause as you ought to strive he Allah has chosen you and has imposed no difficulties on you in religion and that's the other important thing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions here وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجٍ This deen that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with is not meant to cause us difficulty. It's not meant to cause us hardship. In fact, it's the opposite. If we truly understand and we truly take it as it should be taken, it will become a source of happiness and joy and ease for us. But shaitan wants us to look at it as something difficult, difficult to do. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continues, it is the millah of your father Ibrahim. Now the difference between millah and deen, it is he who has named you Muslims both before you and in this that the messenger may be a witness for you. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the important the important point that I want to get, to get across tonight, <coughs> inshallah, about the life of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam, is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him many times. The first test that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him with was, he did not have any kids until he was very old and he kept making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh Allah, I'd like to have a son in order to continue your message. I'm on the truth, but we need to continue this, so see where is his concern. His worry is about continuing the da'wah. And Sarah, his wife, his first wife, Sarah, was barren. She could not give birth. And then finally, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered his dua. So he made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah blessed him with his son, even though he was old. It's a beautiful son, Ismail. And not long after that, Sarah herself gave birth. And she gave birth to Ishaq. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him with the command that he needs to take his wife and his new son and leave them in Mecca. This is a major test. Who, which man is going to leave his wife and his new son in a place where there's no food and no people? But he obeyed. He knew that this is Allah. Allah is his creator. So he submitted and he passed the test. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested him with something even more difficult. He made dua for a son. Allah gave him a son. He loved his son so much. Then Allah said, okay, I gave you the son. Now you sacrifice it. You wanted the son. You have the son now. Now sacrifice it. And then he went to his son Ismail. And he said, Ismail, I saw in a dream. Allah commanding me to sacrifice you. What do you say? What did Ismail say? I will read you the verses. So we gave him the good news of a boy. That is beforehand. So when the boy reached the age of maturity, I see in a dream that I sacrifice you. What is your view? What do you think? Oh my father, 
do what you are commanded. Satajiduni, insha'Allah, min al-sabirin. You will find me, by the will of Allah, those who are patient. Meaning, I will submit. So when they had both submitted, because the father and son had both passed the test, and he had laid him down, ready to sacrifice him, we called out to him, O oh Ibrahim, you have fulfilled the vision. Indeed, do we reward those who do right. For this was obviously a trial. And we ransomed him with a momentous sacrifice. And we left this blessing for him among generations to come in later times. And who are those generations in later times? Us. We are connected to that barakah, to those blessings. To Ibrahim and Ismail passing the test, we share in that reward if we also perform the sacrifice. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked him to sacrifice something that he loved, he was willing to do it, Allah replaced it with a, a ram. So today we do the same thing. Allah is asking us to sacrifice something that we love. It, today we don't own sheep and cattle, but we have the money to buy and pay for it. So Allah is asking us to sacrifice that money because everything belongs to Allah anyway. All, everything belongs to Allah. So that's why the Eid, Eid al-Duha, is the celebration of that willingness to give to Allah what belongs to Him. And we acknowledge that everything belongs to Him, so we are willing. Allah asks for something back, we are happy to give it back because it belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So life is a test. The life of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam demonstrates many of these tests and how they were successful in passing them. We also have many tests in our lives. And Allah is going to test us. Obviously Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tested the prophets with the most severe tests. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not to test us with, hard, with hardship, with difficulties that we cannot bear. But Allah knows what we can manage and Allah will not test us. Allah will not test you with something that you do not have the ability to pass. And we need to believe in that. We need to be sure that Allah will never test anybody unless he has the ability to pass it. Allah does not burden a soul with more than it can bear. He is our creator. So the thing that we need to convince ourselves about is that whatever Allah puts before us, he knows we can do it. So we need to be convinced about that and be steadfast and be like Ismail with, as, 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 a, as a patient, sabirin, with those who are patient, steadfast. Those who have to be firm, they remain steadfast, they don't waver, they don't give in. That's our lives today because then we will be hunafa like Ibrahim al-Halil, the one who was a monotheist. And we need to be, and we, need, we will, inshallah, stay on the same path that Ibrahim established and the Prophet ﷺ came and perfected for us. Jazakallah khairan. Thank you very much for your time. I remind you again, inshallah, that these are the 10 days of the Hajjah. Uh, on Wednesday, the Hajjaj will be going to Mina. Um, then from Mina, they will be going to Arafah on Thursday. So on Thursday is, is, is the big day. Th Arafah is the Hajj for the Hajjaj where they will spend all their time standing, sitting, begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his forgiveness. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts their dua, they will return from their hajj like <coughs> newborn babies with all their past sins washed away. On the day of Arafah, for those of us who are not on hajj, not on Arafah, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, if you fast on that day, you will have two years sins forgiven, the year past and the year coming. So this is a credit of sins forgiven. Doesn't mean that you have this credit now. Okay? Doesn't mean you have a credit. You can let your hair down and just run wild. No. Allah knows even your thinking in doing the fast. Allah knows your intention even before you do the fast. So we need to purify our intention and 
in order to gain the reward, in order to gain the blessing, the intention should be, oh Allah, please forgive our past sins and we will not repeat that sin again. That's how the dua, the dua is accepted. Jazakallahu khairan. أقول قولي هذا وسأغفر الله لي ولكم فاستغفروه فيخرج المستغفرين وينجى جزائهم. To listen to or download more Islamic lectures, please visit www.islamicmedia.com.au.